On January the 4th in 2005, Janelle Hornicle and her boyfriend, Michael Wamsley, both 20, were on their way back home to Mandalay Apartments in Omaha, Nebraska when they became lost and disoriented in a heavy snowstorm. That night, they made five very strange and confusing 911 calls asking for help because they could not find their way home. Around 7.30 that evening, they were pulled over in Geneva, Nebraska because their truck had a missing tail light and they failed to signal. They told the officer that they were lost and they were looking for Pacific Street, but Pacific Street is in Omaha and they are over 100 miles away. They didn't know this at the time, though. In the 911 call, Michael believes they were three blocks from their apartment. The officer didn't notice anything unusual about their behavior, so he gave them a warning. Five hours later, at 12.30 a.m., they were 23 miles away from home and their truck ran off the road. So Janelle called 911, but she wasn't making sense. At 1.05, Michael called 911 and said they had left the truck, but he was still under the assumption that they were near their apartment complex. Dispatcher Patty Viper told them that a police unit had been sent, but couldn't find them at that apartment complex. Janelle's cell phone signal was coming from Sarpy County, Nebraska, not Omaha, but police were still sent to Mandalay Apartments. When Michael was talking with 911, he said, they need to come further south and open the gates. But the problem was there weren't any gates in that area. I don't want to come out I need some assistance right, right now. Where are you? It's an old abandoned pond, like lake front area where they have cattle and an old like gravel pump set up. And we need some assistance like right now. Okay, I can't help you if I don't know where you are. Yeah, no, I'm not lying to you. Sir, I don't think that you're lying to me, but we're going to need to do more work on where you are because we've been to 75th and Poppleton and we cannot find you. Okay? Because they need to come further south. Further south. Open the gates. The gate to what? So by this time, several operators in three counties were talking to each other and desperately trying to figure out where Michael and Janelle might be. They suspected that drugs may be involved, but they didn't know this for sure. They thought maybe they had head injuries or maybe they had hypothermia and that is why they were so confused. No one really knew what was going on. Eventually, Michael and Janelle left the safety of their truck along with their coats and cell phones and they started walking. Now keep in mind, the temperature that night was between negative 4 and negative 10 with the wind chill. Around 1.45 that morning, Michael called 911 again. Where are you at? Oh, oh. out in by the way. It's Oswald over on his top. Oh, it's on his top. Yes, okay. I need help. Mike, you've got to help me help you, okay? I know, I'm trying, but... Okay, so, so we got to just kind of take a deep breath and let's figure out where you're at, okay? Go straight north. Just please, hurry. Okay, we're hurrying. We're getting there as fast as we can. We don't know where you're at. Is that your girlfriend? Yeah. Let me talk to her, okay? Hello? Hi, right, do you have any idea where you're at? Can I talk to our phone call her? I know. There's people on the shack that are flashing the light on top of the shack. Oh, there's people on the shack? Yes. Go go talk to them. Go to the people they in the don't. shack. We've tried. <laughs> they won't talk. We've tried. We've asked for help. We begged. Okay, <laughs> tell, them that the, tell them that the police are on the phone and hand them your phone. Okay. Please, anyone, help me. Come on. It's too cold. Are they responding to you? No. I don't think they speak English. I don't know any of any other languages. Honey, come on, get up. Is she starting to lay down? Yes. Breathing. Please, you can go over here, Dad. Oh, Mike. Mike, I want to help you so bad, hon. I want to find out where you're at. Knowing how cold it was outside, the dispatcher urged him to go back to the truck. But Michael told her the truck had rolled over on its top. So this made the dispatcher worry that it could be leaking gasoline. But at the time, she didn't know that the truck was actually upright. 
At one point, Michael said he was seeing one to 200 people in a field and he was asking them for help, but they just wouldn't respond to him. Around 2 a.m., they called again to say they were at a small shack. Janelle said she was seeing people taking cars apart and they were putting the cars in the trees. I want you to stay in that booth. Whatever you do, you're going to stay in that booth. But I need you to be honest with me, Mike, okay? Yeah. Have you done any kind of drugs tonight? No, I haven't done it, no drugs. We can't prove it if you have. I don't. But it would help me to know if you did. I don't do this, ma'am. I just, I really don't. Well, how come know. all these 200 people that you see can't, you, they can't help you? 911, what's your point, sir? Hi, I'm the one. Mexicans and African Americans and they're all dressed up and like these cold outfits and they're moving all the vehicles. Do I just keep driving back and forth until so I can get out or it'll why won't they let us out? And they're taking the cars apart and putting them in the trees. Yes. Unless the owner is there moving their car for them. So yeah, I think I'm gonna have to start running and get out of the vehicle and I don't know where else to go. The boots are on the way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Their calls kept bouncing off of different cell phone towers and this made it impossible to trace their actual location. They couldn't pinpoint their location because at the time, Nebraska was one of nine states that didn't have a 911 GPS system to track cell phones. Remember, this is 2005. At 3 a.m., Michael called 911 back and said that he was going to walk some more and that he had left the shelter of the shack. His last call came in at 4.20. By now, they had been out in below freezing temperatures for at least four hours. Michael's last call was less than two minutes. Janelle was a junior at Creighton University in Omaha, and she was also a member of a sorority and a business fraternity. She was a good student. She was in the drama club, she sang in the choir, and she was also a cheerleader. She and Michael had dated about a year, but they had known each other since the seventh grade. They both worked at Timberline Total Solutions, which was a telemarketing company, and Michael also did landscaping in the summer. He had dropped out of high school, and his older brother Chris says that he suspected Michael was using drugs and that Michael had even admitted to trying different drugs. His brother said that he gave Michael a warning around their last Thanksgiving together. He told him, whatever you're on, Michael, think about it in the long run. Searchers found Michael's snow-covered body the next day, just east of the Platte River and north of U.S. Highway 6. He was wearing blue jeans and a hooded sweatshirt, and his pickup was also found stuck in the snow. By this time, Janelle's mother was losing hope that her daughter was safe. She said, the longer it goes, the less hope I have. Six days later, they found Janelle at the edge of a sandpit lake. She was found a half mile from Michael and a day after his funeral. Both of them were within two miles of the truck. She was found wearing high-heeled boots, blue jeans, and a hooded shirt. And investigators believe the couple died January 5th, the same day that they called 911. They both died of hypothermia. On New Year's Eve, Janelle and Michael had gone to a party at the house of Judith Morrill and Michael Morrill. This may have been the first time that Janelle had ever tried meth. They both had enough meth in their systems to cause confusion, hallucinations, hot flashes, and anxiety. A small amount of crystal meth, 90% pure, was found in their truck, and they both tested positive for meth at levels that indicated they had taken the drug two or three days before they called 911. Meth combines the hyperactivity of cocaine with the delusions of LSD. It increases the amount of dopamine. It also boosts energy and the user can stay up for days. It's three and a half times more powerful than cocaine and a single hit can keep someone high for as long as 12 hours. The user may start talking about things that aren't real and they may have visual and auditory hallucinations. The more the drug is used, the worse the effects become. It was developed in labs in Europe and Asia, and it wasn't widely used until World War II by German soldiers. They were often high on meth during the war. 
A small amount of meth was found in Michael's truck, and according to toxicology tests, Janelle had 495 nanograms per milliliter of meth in her system, and Michael had 127 nanograms. Investigators that tried to find the source of the meth served a search warrant to Judy and Micah. They were both arrested on suspicion of possessing a controlled substance and drug paraphernalia. Remember all of those people that Michael claimed to see? Well, there is a theory that he was actually seeing and hearing cows. In May of 2005, Janelle's parents agreed to be interviewed by National Geographic to bring awareness to how meth affects the brain the first time that it's used. The episode is called World's Most Dangerous Drug. Janelle's mother, Twyla, said she didn't know that Michael used drugs because Janelle would always tell her that he didn't. She actually saw them earlier in the evening on New Year's Eve, and she didn't notice anything different about them. And she says that she doesn't blame Michael for Janelle's death. 